Welcome to Sex Therapy 101, everyone. I am excited to present. As many of you know, I'm in a sex therapy certification program. Everything that I'm sharing with you, I learned from there or had reinforced from there and learned in our practice. This presentation is going to be a brief introduction. And I also want to just throw out there that since we have some true, true sex therapy experts, in the audience today, I welcome people to jump in at different points, to add context to something that I said, or refute something that I said. If I got it a little wrong, this can be collaborative. I welcome that. Today, we're going to talk about sex. We're going to go over some common sex and relationship myths. We're going to talk about what a sex therapist is and what one does, how to become a sex therapist. We're going to talk about how sexual health and being sex positive are part of being a sex therapist, then we're also going to just not really talk about sexual anatomy, but just talking about it. And then go over some practical stuff from sexual history gathering and assessment to models and theories that will have some takeaways that you'll all be able to use as well as a case study. So here we go. What is sex? And this is just a picture of my, my new rescue dog, Xena, at the vet looking sort of scared. And I thought that was kind of relevant because sex can be scary sometimes. I was curious, actually, we have, you know, such a wide variety of different levels of expertise around sex and the audience. Maybe some people have ideas about how to define sex. Go ahead and shout them out if you have any. Maybe something about pleasure and intimate touch or intimate connection. Yeah. Maybe maybe something involving the consensual nature of kind of what Shannon was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Stimulation. Those yeah. kinds of words. All, all relevant words. There's the difference between sex, which is what we think of like biological identification. Right. And then totally. there's sexual sexuality, sex, sex, sexual, everything else. Yeah. And on top of that, for some people, sex just means intercourse and for others. It means so much else. So a few different definitions. One is it's a sexually motivated phenomena or behavior. There's that consent word in the next one, a consensual activity designed to arouse a physiological response. Anything connected with sexual gratification, there's kind of the pleasure piece or reproduction or the urge for these or the capacity for sexual feelings and or actions. The term postmodern comes up a lot. The current way that sex therapy is taught, what are considered the best practices and like a postmodern approach to thinking about what sex is, is to say that maybe there isn't actually one all encompassing definition and really defining it isn't the job of a sex therapist. In fact, our job is to create a dialogue with clients so they can decide for themselves. Okay, so here's some fun sex and relationship myths. And I included these because some of them are absurd. Um, some of them, it's like, oh, that's a myth, right? Uh, a lot of the times we carry these biases as therapists based on our own sexual experiences, and we end up applying them to our clients, what we consider is normal, it ends up just slipping through into the therapeutic work. So these are just a couple of ways to check yourself. One is that kink is rare and unhealthy. There's some research that shows that people who engage in BDSM are actually more emotionally healthy on average than people who don't. That's one interesting thing. Another is that open or non-monogamous relationships don't work in the long term. A lot of therapists hold this bias. Again, there's research that shows that suggests it's not true. Another one, and this is a juicy one, is that porn causes divorce or relationships to end. There's some statistic that often gets cited by people who are anti-porn or just sex negative. It's that porn is involved in 50% of divorces. But from a sex positive, sex therapy perspective, that would be mistaking porn for a cause instead of as a symptom, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that. 
another that I've actually heard is that trauma causes unwanted same-sex attraction. Hopefully we all know it's not a thing. <laughs> Here it is in big text. Casual sex is unhealthy. It's hard not to hold some bias around this because it's really just like in the air, the sort of stigma around casual sex. It's just something that we have to check with our, in with ourselves about when we have clients who are engaging in it. And casual sex does not mean cheating. There's an important distinction there. What are some myths that you all would love to debunk? Things that you hear from clients or from other therapists or people in your lives? I've had a, a client say that she stopped seeing a former therapist because the therapist didn't believe that open relationships could be successful. A great way to disconnect from your client and not have a successful therapeutic relationship. That sexual sexuality is a, a finite period, whereas my training has always been we are sexual from birth to death, and that it just in different formats and different ways. And so that children are sexual, our elderly are sexual. But being sexual does not mean the same thing in every single context. That's a really big one. Here's just a list of some other ones. We're not going to talk about any of them in depth, but feel free to just scan through this. One, I already mentioned that sex equals penis and vagina, that everybody likes longer sex. One of the first myths that was busted for me working in this field is that men want sex and women want love. I would say most of my couples it's the opposite in that the women want sex and the men are avoiding sex in the relationship. We'll keep moving. So what actually is a sex therapist? A sex therapist is someone who is a licensed therapist, so it could be social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, marriage and family therapist, professional counselor, who focuses on the psychological side of sex. They're able to diagnose sexual dysfunction, as in with the disorders in the DSM. Importantly, and this distinguishes sex therapists from others who work in the sexuality field, for instance, at least historically in like the sex addiction field, uh, sex therapists are sex positive. We'll talk a little more about that. And sex therapists have highly specialized training. Everybody's got the sort of training that I'm getting. These are some things that a sex therapist does, everything from kink to fetishes, sexual pain, which we heard from Dr. Faust about, performance issues, issues with porn, gender issues, out of control sex. And this is just a, a very brief list of some interventions that a sex therapist might engage in with clients from focusing on sexual health, reconceptualizing health, if you've ever heard about what are sexual scripts that you have, helping clients figure out their sexual or erotic orientations. Shame is a big thing that comes up in sex therapy, right? Um, learning how to be more mindful in your body during sex. There's often a lot of homework in sex therapy. There's a strong behavioral component to it, which we'll get more into that. The most well-known way to become certified as a sex therapist is through ASECT. ASECT is a certifying association. Here are the requirements to become a sex therapist certified through ASECT. So one is two years of practice as a therapist. These hours all refer to educational hours. So it could be hours from an academic program. It could be through continuing ed. You have to do these sexual attitude reassessments where you're in groups and you're exposed to media that is often shocking, that helps you reassess your attitudes about sexuality. And you have to document 300 hours of clinical work with sexually related clients and you need 50 hours of supervision. The field of sex therapy is guided by the principles of sexual health, which come from the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization talks about four pillars of health, physical, mental, spiritual, and sexual. Sexual health is integrating your personal values, ethics, religious beliefs, cultural norms, as well as unconventional sexual interests or practices. And Sex therapists use these to provide ground rules and a map in their work with clients to help clients to understand their own personal ideas of what sexual health means to them. Here are the six principles of sexual health as 
identified by the World Health Organization. So we have consent, non-exploitation, any sort of sex that involves power dynamics where, that are compromised or where people's safety is compromised or people are being taken advantage of for money or shelter. Honesty, it's about effective communication. I would say that's probably 50% of what sex therapists do is helping people to communicate honestly. Having shared values, clarifying what's actually important to you as far as sex goes and discussing that with partners, being protected from STIs, HIV, unwanted pregnancies is important. And then pleasure. This is like about good stuff. That is part of health is just experiencing sexual pleasure. And that's both on your own and with partners. And then being sex positive is the other kind of like big tentpole thing that is at the base of this field. Being sex positive is really the gold standard in this work. It means celebrating sexual diversity and possibilities. Coming from the starting point of sexuality as a potentially positive force in one's life rather than the starting point that sex is a problem or is problematic or shameful. There's this idea that sex is natural, generally healthy in all its different variations and can be a source of creativity for people. Pathology is never the underlying assumption, even if perhaps there is some pathology that ends up being there. Again, that's sort of like that focus on symptoms rather than the underlying problems. When we were talking about porn before, that, that's the distinction. The DSM and sex positivity have not always played nicely together, right? Homosexuality was once in the DSM, right? And not so long ago. Here is the framework for how the DSM talks about if sex is pathological. So if it creates personal distress, that's not due to social stigma, really difficult to actually separate that as it turns out, if the sex is non-consensual or if it feels compulsive or out of control. And the C and A are often really tied up together. People tend to do things compulsively when there is social stigma, um, which we don't have time to get into too much today. But the idea with compulsiveness is it'll initially relieve tension and anxiety, but it actually ends up causing remorse and distress afterwards. Another way that a sexual behavior may be falling into that pathological category is if it causes personal distress when it's so exclusive and the individual can't experience pleasure in any way. So sometimes we see that with certain fetish cases. Most important perhaps about sex positivity is that distress is generally soci societally generated, right? And so that goes back to that a creates personal distress that is not due to social stigma and how difficult it is to actually parse that out. Generally, it's the shame that's doing the damage to the person about their sexual selves and behavior, not the sex itself. It's the shame. We actually don't have time to get into sexual anatomy, but it is a very important part of sex therapy. If you do training in it, you'll get some training in sexual anatomy. I just would want to include one slide. We won't spend a ton of time on this, but I do think it's useful to have some context for this field and where it comes from. But first, pre-Freud in the Victorian era, sexuality was viewed as a moral phenomenon. Then with Freud and psychoanalysis, sexuality started playing a larger part in how people think about mental health. And there was this connection, and Tanya brought this up earlier when she brought up the myth that we are sexual from an early age. Disturbances in the present often come from our developmental history and relationship to sex and relationships and our bodies. Then with these researchers, Kinsey, Masters, and Johnson, there was this focus on behavioral therapy to approach sexual dysfunction, particularly with couples. And they were focused on men who whose erectile dysfunction deviated from what they determined was a normal sexual response cycle. And we'll actually talk about the sexual response cycle in more depth later. But the important thing to know is that they were focused on helping clients to become more mindful in their bodies. They weren't calling it mindfulness, but that is 100% what they were doing. Then there's the sexual revolution of the 70s when it was like, all sex is great. And then very quickly, it was like all sex is bad with the 80s and the HIV uh, epidemic and 
that's when dysfunctions started appearing in the DS. Then in the 90s, you get Viagra and the medicalization of sexual dysfunction. Now people can go to their primary care doctor or nurse practitioner and say, something's not working. Can I have Viagra? And there's no referral to sex therapy and there's no discussion around sex. There's this focus on the biological aspects of sexual functioning over the psychosocial ones. This term postmodernism again, which focuses again on celebrating a diversity of sexual variation. It views sexual dysfunction primarily as a socially constructed thing, talking about that shame, that shame creates sexual dysfunction, not the other way around, at least sort of as the starting point. The idea is that sexual desire, too, in the same way, is contextual and created. Implicit is a really important model from the sex therapy field. It has these four parts to it. The model is created to help really non-sex therapists to do some really basic sex therapy work with clients who are presenting for sexual issues. And once we get to the IT intensive therapy, we'll talk about how sex therapy specifically comes in. The first is permission. The therapist or practitioner or clinician is creating comfort and permission for the clients to discuss their sexual concerns, validating their concerns and just the idea that talking about sex is okay and sexuality is a legitimate health issue. Then we have limited information. So the clinicians addressing the specific concerns that the client has and doing some myth busting, providing some basic psychoeducation that is tailored to the presenting issues that the client's bringing. And then specific su suggestions basically means treatment planning and interventions. So based on a basic assessment of the issue and concern to the client and how they've evolved over time, you're providing some options for resolution of the issues. These tend to be very realistic and behavioral, solution-oriented behavioral interventions that you might see for erectile dysfunction or vaginal pain, like the dilators. These are all interventions that might fall in specific suggestions. And then intensive therapy, when clients' issues aren't resolved in that shorter term approach, the intensive therapy comes in, and this is where only sex therapists are qualified to do the work. They're exploring in more depth the psychological or the intersection of the psychology with the presenting sexual issues. There might be occurring disorders like depression or anxiety or OCD or personality, substance use. We'll go into an example of what this looks like with a case study at the end of the presentation. Another model for working with sex-related clients is the good enough sex model. This takes a biopsychosocial approach, so opposed to a doctor just prescribing Viagra without any sort of psychosocial counseling, that's a biological approach. Good enough sex focuses not so much on, like if the goal of Viagra is to help a man to perform in a very particular way during sex, right, to have an erection that lasts long enough in order to ejaculate during intercourse. Good enough sex is maybe it's not such a problem that you're losing your erection. Maybe it's okay and this is providing you an opportunity to explore other aspects of your sexuality with yourself or with your partner. Um, instead of focusing on goal-oriented approach to sex, it's focusing on the relational aspects of sex, the emotional, creating acceptance around imperfection, basic but powerful. When you're doing sex therapy, starting out, you're doing a sexual history and assessment, and I just provided some intro example questions that you might ask for family background. It might just ask about how parents showed love and affection, both with you and with each other. You might ask about religion, how that might be connected to sexuality. With early sexual experiences, you're asking about when they first masturbated, what messages you were given about your body growing up, about gender roles, current experiences and attitudes. So that's focusing more on the present, like what's your most positive sexual experience, least positive. 
what happened the last time you had sex, really breaking it down, who initiated it, what was it like, how were you feeling before, how you were you feeling after. And I'll pause here just to ask if others who practice sex therapy, if there's any go-to sexual history and assessment prompts or questions. I'm, I'm asking about history of first wanted sexual experience. And then also history of any times where they felt like they didn't give consent or felt scared or out of control around sex. I also like to ask, how did people refer to their body parts? Are we using cutesy names or were we using more medically appropriate? I think that simple response often gives another deeper insight. And who taught them about what the expectations were for sexual interactions? Were they learning it from their friends? Did they get the 30 minute thing in health or did their parents just throw a book and run out the door or did they sit down and have as many embarrassing conversations as possible? And porn, like how old they were when they figured out what porn was, what their introduction to it was. Yeah. And often people are learning about what sex is through porn. If they had really early introductions to it and they didn't have other sort of formative influences that were explicitly telling them. One of the tools that sex therapists use is a sexual response model, and they might use multiple models. Three models here, they're of equal importance. It was just much easier to use an illustration of the middle one than to write it out myself. First, I'm just going to talk about why sex therapists use sexual response models and what one is. So a sexual response cycle is it's a sequence of physical and emotional changes that occur as a person becomes sexually aroused and participates in sexually stimulating activities, which could include intercourse or masturbation. The first model that gained a lot of prominence came from Masters and Johnson, who focused on bringing sort of teaching mindfulness skills um, to couples. Um, that's where Sensate Focus comes from, by the way, if any of you have used it. They broke the sexual response cycle down to four parts, excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. People criticize this approach because they think of it as being too linear. They say that not everybody starts with excitement, that people start at different points in the cycle. Not everybody needs spontaneous desire to start a sexual experience. So in comes then Basson's model of sexual motivation, which is much more fluid and you can actually enter at any point in the cycle and the spontaneous desire is separate because it's not a prerequisite. You could have responsive desire as in somebody asks you, do you want to have sex? And maybe you're not in the mood, but you just do it anyway because you love that person and that's a fun thing to do. Then the excitement comes or plateau or whatever it may be. And then Bancroft and Jansen have the dual control model, which is a little bit simpler. I, I love how simple it is. The two parts of the model are sexual excitation and sexual inhibition. So essentially people are constantly getting pulled in one direction or the other, right? And so if you want to help use this model, if you want to apply this model to sex therapy, you might be helping a couple to think about the factors that create excitement, right? And help them to focus on those or the factors that lead to inhibition and to try not to do those, right? So very simple, um, but also potentially very powerful. And with the other models too, the benefit is when you're using them with clients, you can pinpoint more specifically where they're experiencing dysfunction, where they're running into conflict and tailor your interventions then to those issues. In general, a goal of postmodern sex therapy is to help to bring people from a rigid focus on goal-oriented performance like orgasm, ejaculation, to something that is more focused on them and their subjective experience. Moving from this sort of question that so many people come into therapy with of, am I doing this right? Am I normal, right? This externally imposed idea, societally imposed idea that creates all this shame. So you're moving from that to how do I want to feel? 
and then empowering the client to pursue that and see where it leads them. Um, some qualitative research on what makes up great sex. And so these are eight components that she and her co-authors found. So from being present, being connected, having sexual and erotic intimacy, interpersonal risk-taking, exploration, authenticity, vulnerability, and transcendence. And I love that last one in particular, right? It's like sex can be spiritual and why shouldn't it be? We can sort of pull some of this stuff together by talking about a case that I had a couple of years ago. This was with a cisgender male who was struggling with erectile dysfunction and low sexual desire. He wasn't currently in a relationship. He thought he was experiencing increased anxiety due to a thyroid medication. He was taking Cialis prescribed by his primary care doctor but still wasn't experiencing spontaneous desire or consistent erections. So I applied the plicit model starting out with him. So we're gonna walk through that. So the first thing, deceptively simple, often the most powerful part of it was just giving him permission to discuss the stuff that probably didn't feel comfortable talking about with anyone else in his life. Just validating that like his concerns made sense that this was a safe place to talk about them. Then I was sharing with him some limited information or psychoeducation on erectile dysfunction and desire. I was providing specific suggestions on behavioral techniques to try. I was giving him homework to do a mindful masturbation exercise where he is tracking his sexual excitement from zero to 100, so he's noticing what 0% sexually excited feels like in his body, and not just in his genital area, but in his whole body, all the way up to 10%, 20%, 50%, and then seeing where he tended to get stuck, right? Where he tended to either lose focus, lose his erection. Um, as he started to build some confidence doing that exercise, we started working intensively on rewriting the, his sexual narratives, his scripts around masculinity, performance, and sex, going from a script that I'm less of a man if I lose an erection to I'm not less of a man if I lose an erection to it's normal to lose your erection during sex. And it's actually not that normal to be consistently 100% erect during a sexual experience. Trying on a new script of it's okay to share about sexual insecurities with partners, that that doesn't make him less of a man. He doesn't have to be virile, authorit uh, authoritarian sexual partner. It's okay to take sex slowly by asking himself for consent each step of the way, that he's allowed to ask for more foreplay. He doesn't have to be the one who's jumping to intercourse until he's actually wanting that or until if he's wanting that and ready for that. And asking himself for consent, and I actually wrote a tip on that um, on our website, was surprisingly powerful and was really sticky for him. That was like a mantra he could bring with him in, in, into interactions with other people. Through all of that, we attacked it from both angles, the behavioral angle or the medical angle. He has this problem, right? The sexual dysfunction problem, but also from the angle of the shame, the societal stigma, the gender stuff. He finished therapy and started a new relationship where he was coming from a place of vulnerability and honesty from the get-go. That was a great success. That is what I have, and I'd love to hear questions. What do people have for me? I adore this so much. You added things, I think, which is so apropos for somebody's like, what is sex therapy from a therapist's point of view? of like, these are the type of interventions. These are all the different ways that we could do this. So I love that that detail of making it so applicable for someone who is a therapist without being too technical. 
you just really simplified so many things. And I love the case presentation. Yeah. What I love about the models is how we could use them in therapy. When I present the Masters and Johnson, I add the Kaplan to it. So it's Kaplan, Masters and Johnson's, which adds the desire component. Yeah. What I love about that is the juxtaposition of thinking about desire as your go-go juice with the blinders mm. on, like it's, mm. it's oof, we're ready. And so when folks are ready for desire, that feeling is very, when I, when I make a bid for sexual intimacy with my partner and I'm in desire phase, that has a different intensity, different, like, let's go. Whereas comparison, if I'm coming from the Besson model, which was originally identified as the female sexual model, because more right. women were identifying, but coming from this place of, wouldn't it be nice? is oftentimes where the starting point of sexual motivation is, you know, wouldn't it be nice? Cause I know sex is a good thing that is good for our relationship. And I know eventually my desire and stuff will come on, but that starting point of wouldn't it be nice versus go-go juice. And you notice go-go juice typically doesn't show up for women until like the fourth or fifth or the sexual motivation model, like fourth or fifth place. Mm -hmm. What I like using that with couples is helping them understand mm -hmm. just because my partner may come from a wouldn't it be nice place doesn't mean they don't desire me doesn't mean that i'm not somebody who's important to them which is that part of that discrepancy i feel like in sex therapy with couples is i want to feel desired or i want to feel or i feel like i have to convince them it's like you know we just got to create space because there's a lot of points if you're in that other cycle where your brain gets distracted but wait until their go-go juice comes on board and then we'll be in a very similar energy. And then with the Bancroft and the other one, it's helping them understand it's a duality. Like you said, that we think so much of the gas pedal, which is the sexual excitatory system of like lingerie, date night. That's great. That's all gas pedal. But if it's not an issue with your gas pedal, it's more of an issue of your braking system. Flooding the gas pedal when you have the emergency parking brake on, you're not going anywhere. I love finding these great ways to give permission for folks using the implicit model of like, of course, this is why we are the way we are. And let's just better understand it so we can have good enough sex. Right. Um, but you use all the same, I love these models. So kudos. I love this. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, I, I love everything that you shared. It's all, all really useful. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions about the presentation? Or questions about becoming a sex therapist and what's involved with that? We have somebody in a sex therapy PhD program here. We have me in a sex therapy certification program. We have a certified sex therapist. Uh, there's a lot of expertise. I really like the presentation. Did you share where your program is? It's through an organization called the Sexual Health Alliance based in Colorado. The program, it's like 50% asynchronous learning and then 50% like synchronous, like weekend intensives where they're kind of like conferences that you go to. It's very well done and engaging and really interesting. I have been really pleased. It's expensive, but all the different ways of becoming a sex therapist are expensive. And that's one of the real sort of uh, criticisms of the field is there's just an extremely high bar uh, barrier to entry. All right, we are at the end. So thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to talking more about sex therapy in the weeks and months to come. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.